Good morning. Good morning. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law, under COVID-19 emergency declaration, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure everyone participating in the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by the clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, Please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. All meeting activity is being recorded via the platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. We have provided for those who wish to speak on a particular case via our website and email. We also received emails from those who have provided written comment on a particular matter. Mr. Chairman, the meeting's yours. Thank you. Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Present. Downing. Present. Fluker. Curry. Present. Paul. Oh. Here. Stami? She just muted herself. Okay. And slight. Present. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, before we get started. I have lost. Sorry. Oh, there's Stami. So before we get started, I ask people to keep their um, uh, presentations brief. I have a hard stop at noon, and I'd like to keep a quorum all the way through. So, uh, the first one is a special presentation for Public Art Bridge Avenue. Sarah, are you on the call? I am. Go Good ahead. Morning, Good morning, Commission. Uh, this first project, uh, Bridge Avenue Beautification Mural, is part of a neighborhood wide. A beautification project that is being led by uh, community members in the Bridge Avenue Block Club and uh, Andrea Lopsey is spearheading this. Um, you all may remember back in the fall, there was an approval of some light poles, utility poles uh, between, I believe, 48th and 65th that were painted artistically to bring some color and vibrancy to the neighborhood. This project is uh, phase two of that. Um, it is not in the design review district uh, and it the project uh, kind of lapses into both uh, Ward 15 with uh, Matt Zone as well as uh, Ward 3 with Councilman uh, Kerry McCormick. This particular installation is in Kerry McCormick's ward but has also received the support of Councilman Matt Zone who sent a letter of support stating um, how the Bridge Brigade, uh, Brigade Block Club, as well as the artists, were close to the community through several meetings to uh, come up with the concept that was responsive to what the community wanted to see. So, um, with that support, as well as my own, um, I just want to turn it over to Andrea for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Hello, I'm everyone. Andrea. I just wanted to remind you that I'll be changing the slides. So, just let me know when uh, you need a slide change. Got it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone's time. Excited to kick off phase two, hopefully, of our project that we started last year. Um, you can actually go to the next side. I wanted to capture just the summary of the project. I have a short presentation where I'm going to recap um, a little bit more about what we did last year and then where we're taking it this year. Um, but really, this entire project has been about neighborhood 
beautification. I am the co-chair of our local block club, which runs from 48th on Bridge Avenue all the way down to 65th. So a lot of households in between Lorraine and Franklin. Uh, we work pretty closely with Eco Village and the Clinton Block Club, West Clinton and Franklin as well. So we're a pretty tight knit group. Uh, we do a lot of collaborating. Um, so we've been talking about beautification projects for a long time. And this really is focused on phase two of what we began last year. Really the goal and the summary of the project is to create more vibrancy, more energy around the neighborhood, especially in this COVID time. You know, we see a lot of people walking the dogs, um, outside with their families, enjoying the, the weather before it gets really cold. Um, so I think it's more important than ever that we're creating a safe environment, a vibrant, colorful, welcoming environment for neighbors, um, and also a really great destination for people to potentially move to. As we know, this area is thriving right now with development and families moving in. So um, that's really what we're trying to do with this entire project. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the specific goals are obviously to add color to our neighborhood, continue what we've started. Um, also a photo destination. This mural is a pretty big landscape, but I'll show you what it looks like, obviously. But um, it will be something that hopefully people will be talking about and excited about and take pictures of. Um, and really, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to turn an eyesore in the neighborhood to eye candy, as I'm calling it. Um, it's a pretty prominent corner in the neighborhood, and it's you know, it's an old dead gas station that's been there painted gray and kind of not taken care of for a long time. So um, I think this would really create that colorful kind of feeling that we were shooting for. You can go to the next slide. Just wanted to capture the project timeline and also recap what we did last year. So last year, I know a few of you were there when I came in person to present our idea for the telephone poles. Um, and if you live in the area or if you've ever driven down Bridge Avenue, hopefully you've seen them. We painted 22 telephone poles um, from 48th all the way down to 65th, um, which we're really excited about, had a really good uh, response, and it looked beautiful with the snow and even right now um, as the leaves are changing. Um, this year, phase two, we started with really cleaning up one of the local parks in our neighborhood. So it's on um, 58th and Bridge, a little further down. Um, very small park, so we're kind of reimagining what we want it to be as a park and doing cleanup projects. We've already kicked that off in September. This uh, month, October, we're hoping to paint the mural before it turns really cold. Uh, we also, I actually got a trash can put in at that corner for, you know, dog bags and just extra trash. There really wasn't one outside of uh, 52nd Street. And then also our block club has purchased uh, a dog bag stand with bags that people can grab and use as they walk around the neighborhood. Leading into next year, we also have plans for phase three, which is continued maintenance of Simmons Park. Um, and then also some different artwork installations um, using metal and kind of creating that feel that we've created with the color. Um, so hopefully I'll be back to present to you guys about that, but that'll be next year. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is just kind of recapping the location from 48th to 65th is really our main focus for these beautification projects. You can go to the next slide. And then this is really what the poles, this is kind of how they turned out. Um, obviously, I couldn't take a picture of all 22 and capture it. So we've tried to create um, a collage of what they look like at different points. Um, so you can see some folks walking in the one um, and the pole and how nice it looks. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is kind of a, a picture looking down from 52nd. So you can see there's a couple poles painted on the corners here. We painted that trash can. Um, and if you look down bridge, you see all of the color and it really pops. And I think we really were able to create the effect we were going for. Next slide. So phase two, this is the location 48th and bridge. This gas station is 95 feet long. Um, and then it is about 15 feet high. Um, so we're looking at it from the corner, looking north. Um, you can see there's a little graffiti on it, and you know it's not really well maintained. There's also an old kind of gas station sign in the front that's being blocked by the tree. Uh, but this project would really kick off kind of cleaning up this whole block. Um, there is now a trash can, as I mentioned, on the right side, and there will be a dog bag stand uh, right next to the trash can. Um, we're also looking at painting the side of it, which you'll see a better angle if you click to the next side. You can see kind of this building at different angles. You can see that side um, that we're looking at painting. So if you're coming 
down Bridge Avenue. Um, looking to your right, you'll see this beautiful mural along the side as well as in the front. We are able to paint right over the garage doors and those windows that you see. Um, and obviously we've been in contact with the building owner. Um, if you go to the next side, you'll see it from the aerial view. So this is just kind of capturing it on Bridge Avenue. Um, one of the first things I did was reach out to the building owner. It is a private building. It's owned by Gelada um, Incorporated. Um, they are huge supporters of doing this. Um, you know, they've maintained this building. They don't have any plans to sell it. They're actually trying to get tenants in it, uh, which I'm not sure if they're going to be able to, but um, they are excited about it. And I've actually been working with um, the daughter's, the owner's daughter uh, pretty frequently and from last year until now, just kind of corresponding and, and communicating our plans. Uh, next slide. Um, Sherwin Williams, I've also talked to you. They're actually giving us a 50% discount on paint. Um, they actually gave us a discount on the paint we needed for the polls last year. So I'm working with someone different since they closed the Ohio City store, but I'm working with the St. Clair store downtown. Um, they've been super supportive um, and they will be giving us uh, the paint that we need, the super paint, which is um, exterior, um, will hold up really well through the elements um, at a big discount. So that'll be helpful. We're also going to be using anti-graffiti coating. So this will actually repel um, graffiti. It won't prevent it, obviously. But if we do have graffiti painted at any point, um, all we'll need to do is use a big power washer, which I actually own, my husband owns, um, and we can easily walk down and get rid of it, hoping we don't see that. But obviously, we run the chance. So that, that extra coating at the very end will hopefully help that. Um, and then obviously, we'll need materials like a ladder, which we have, paintbrushes, um, cans, mixers, tarps etc. You can go to the next slide. I wanted to capture some of the local support. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this without our grant from Neighborhood Connections. So we actually got a grant last year for phase one. We did receive another grant this year for phase two. Um, so we're very thankful and grateful for the support from the local uh, Neighborhood Connections. Also, Tara mentioned Councilman Zone. He's been a huge support and very helpful with this entire process. I actually kicked off with him um, at the Detroit Shoreway office last year, not knowing exactly what we wanted to do and how to do it. Um, so he really helped navigate a lot of this and he's been a big advocate for our block club. Um, and we really appreciate his support. Um, Detroit Shoreway, I've been working with them. They're actually serving as our fiscal agent. So um, been working with a, a bunch of different members at the organization and they're obviously in support of what we're doing. And then Gelada Fuel Products, I mentioned they are the owners of the building. So I've been talking with them since the beginning. Um, I actually just received a letter um, of support and basically like one page contract agreement that we typed up for them that says they will not tear down the building um, within five years. So that was one of our concerns was like, hey, what if they sell this prime corner in Ohio City? She's assured me that they're not going to, but uh, we wanted to get it in writing and they actually agreed to it. So we do have an agreement from them that this mural will stay put for at least five years. And if they do have a uh, transfer of ownership, it still stays. If the tenant moves in, it still stays. Um, the tenant she was actually talking to about moving in here, he was actually pretty excited about it as well. So um, very happy we actually got that in writing. We didn't think we would, but we did. Um, so a lot of local support throughout this whole process. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Um, before I show you the mural, I wanted to capture some of the artist's work. So Garrett Wider will be the artist we're working with primarily. Um, Garrett led the telephone poles painting. He's, uh, you know, a member of the community. He's very passionate about community projects. These are just a small sample of some of the things that he's done around the city. Um, he does a lot of cool skylines. He's very passionate about Cleveland. Um, he's done some bridge work. He's painted interior, exterior murals. Um, this one is the si side of a garage with kind of the floral aspect, which is kind of the direction we're going. Um, so he is very excited to get involved with this project with phase two, um, as well as Hector Vega. Um, if you're familiar with his work, he's also supporting the project. He might not be actually painting, but he's been involved um, since the beginning as well. And he's also a big advocate for the neighborhood. If you go to the next slide. So this is the proposed mural kind of in the works. This was the black and white version that Garrett was hand drawing. So he's actually hand drawn all of these flowers. Uh, we really thought flowers on 
this uh, prime kind of corner of the neighborhood would be great for, you know, showing the growth that we've experienced, creating still that vibrancy of color and energy, uh, but doing it in a way where we don't necessarily have to maintain flowers, right? We've talked about a lot of different things, planters and, you know, things that we'd have to water, take care of, flowers that are like hanging baskets, that kind of thing. Um, so we're moving in a different direction. We're trying to use artwork to capture what we want to capture with uh, the look and feel of the neighborhood. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see the mural painted um, on the building. Um, it is, I will have to say, it is a little bright because of Photoshop. So this is kind of the computer generated, obviously. Um, so it won't be quite as neon-y as it comes across here. Uh, but you can see these are large kind of in-your-face flowers. And we're creating that different color and vibrancy uh, look and effect with the petals themselves. Um, it'll wrap from the front all the way to the side, as you see here. Um, and really just be a really great kind of addition to the corner, um, as I said. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Maintenance plan, uh, this is the last slide. Um, really, we're going to be monitoring the property. So everyone involved in this project lives locally. We walk by this gas station almost every day when we're out and about. Um, so we're going to keep a close eye on it, obviously, to, to watch for ongoing maintenance. We're going to clean it as needed. So we've got that anti-graffiti coating on it. Um, you know, our block club takes responsibility for making sure that if we need to power wash or clean it, we can. Um, and then touch up as needed. We're going to kind of look at how the how it holds up. Um, obviously, we're, we're using the right kind of paint and we're doing the right thing. So um, it should hold up for quite a while. There's no guarantee about years or anything, but we'll definitely be watching it through the winter. We'll reassess next spring and summer and touch it up as needed. We'll obviously have leftover paint to do that. Um, and I think that's it. I think the last slide yep, is it. So I will turn it over to questions. Thank you very much. Hey, Matt, did you want to add something? I see you're on the call. Uh, Matt, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my camera is not working on my phone, but I've been working with this uh, block club and Andrea is an amazing community leader for a couple of years now. Uh, they've been thinking pretty strategically about how they can invigorate and splash art all throughout this Bridge Avenue quarter, and I'm fully supportive of this project. Thank you, Matt. Commission members? Move approval, downing. Second, Paul. We have a motion second, further discussion? Um, I just wanted to, I was just going to say this is Lillian. Um, I, I didn't realize there was neighborhood connections funding in, which is from the Cleveland Foundation. So um, I, I, I will just abstain from this. All right. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, Michael, want to call the roll, please? Sure. Bowen? Yes. Downing? Yes. Booker? Yes. Paul? Yes. Slide. Yes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. The next one is public art, uh, graffiti art, uh, mural. Good morning. Um, again, this mural, graffiti art mural is doing, um, is part of a larger uh, project uh, being spearheaded by Midtown Cleveland. Um, as you all know, uh, when this came before you, uh, last year, I believe, or earlier this year for Pow Wow Festival, which is being renamed. This particular mural is set to um, kick that off. It's at 3038 Payne Avenue, which is part of the Euclid Corridor Design Review District. It did go before that design review yesterday and was approved. Um, and I am going to go ahead. Um, I support the mural. I think it's, it's a great way to kick it off. It's very different than most of the other artwork we see around the city. So it's just nice to have some diver diversity in the styles of murals that we um, have in our inventory. So I'm gonna turn this over to um, Kara Sang of Midtown Cleveland and Joe Lanzalotta to go into further detail about the location, the artists and, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Um, yeah, I'll start it off and then and Karis can jump in um, to talk a little bit more about uh, the property owner. but. Um, as Tara said, this this is part of um, the project formerly known as Pow Wow. Um, the, we're still working with that group uh, to to help put on this festival next year. 
Um, we're looking at a tentative date of, of late August. Um, um, it was originally supposed to kick off June of this year, um, but due to the pandemic, we had to push it back to September and then ultimately um, had to reschedule it for August of uh, 2021. So um, in hopes of getting some things done um, this year uh, to kind of bring some vibrancy to the community and, and um, you know, a little positivity. Uh, we wanted to do a couple of our projects uh, in the lead up to the bigger festival. So this is one of them. Um, we're working with Graffiti Heart, um, who, it, who has come on as, as a program partner uh, for what we're now calling the Cleveland Walls Festival. Um, I think you can advance the slide. Um, so yeah, as Tara said, this is on the Good Harvest uh, Food Market building at 3038 Payne Avenue, um, kind of the border of Midtown and Asiatown. Um, it's a west-facing wall. Uh, where we actually got approval um, in the first run of pro uh, project approvals to do the opposite wall of this building as well. So there will be uh, two murals on this building, one east-facing, one west-facing. Um, it's about a 70-foot wall. Um, they're going to be using aerosol and um, outdoor kind of bucket paint uh, for the project. Um, they'll also be working with um, a handful of students from uh, the Cleveland Institute of Art uh, through their um, through their scholarship program that that Graffiti Heart puts on, um, and those. Uh, students will be working with um, local artists Bob Peck and Miguel Garcia uh, to get this project done. So it's a really cool collaborative um, of artists and um, younger folks who who um, who are kind of um, um, working on their 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 graffiti portfolio um, as well as their their visual art portfolios. So. Um, this is a really cool opportunity to to get some youth involved um, in this project. Um, I think you could advance the slide. So the project um, is based on a a style, um, both graffiti style and um, taking um, the Gundam style um, as kind of the the conceptual basis for the project. And Gundam is um, an anime series that um, has been around for, for a long time. It's a pretty famous um, style, um, but I, I believe it started in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, it's kind of uh, ro robotic characters. Um, you'll see from the, the concept, um, the kind of vibrancy of, of these visuals. So you can advance the slide. This just shows an aerial of the building, the front of the building. So we'll have a mural on the, the right and on the left uh, sides of this building. Next slide. This is the wall we're looking at for, for this project. Next slide. Again, just a little bit about the local artists who will be kind of helping, um, well, who will be painting the wall, but also um, working with the students. Uh, next slide. And this this would be the, the mural design. So um, you can see kind of what style we're talking about, the, the Gundam style um, characters in the in the center and, and kind of flanking um, and also the graffiti, um, the graffiti elements um, on the left and right hand sides of, of the, the piece. Next slide. This is just a mock-up of the concept on the wall. And Karis, I don't know if you want to jump in and say anything about um, about the concept and about the property owner and, sure. and what's going on in Asia Town. Yep, absolutely. Um, hi everyone, Karis Asia Asiatown project manager with Midtown. Um, thanks, Joe. This was a great overview. I just wanted to know, you know, as Graffiti Heart is a program partner in Pow Wow, we really did just let them kind of run with the with the idea and the project um, for this. Um, but we did work with a number of stakeholders to run the concept by them, of course, with the property owner as well as some other key stakeholders in the neighborhood. And um, again, I think this is really different from some other artwork in the neighborhood, but consensus just being that it 
really draws from a different generation and a different group in the neighborhood. Um, Asia Town, I think, is very diverse and um, just age and race and culture. And um, so I think this is, has the opportunity to engage um, a, a younger generation. Again, Gundam is a huge, huge um, anime manga um, from, as Joe mentioned, the, um, around the 80s and um, kind of a generational cultural piece. So um, we've had a lot of um, interest in people who just are remembering watching it when they were younger and kind of really drawn towards the movement and vibrancy in the piece. Thank you. Uh, commission members? I move approval, Downing. Second, Fluker. We have a motion second, further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowling. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. I believe Stami was abstaining from the vote. Okay, thank you. And Slay. Yes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Next are lot consolidation lot splits. This is for permanent partial number 10608024025026027 and 028. Uh, located on East 65th Street. Um, who's here for this, Maurice? Yep, Dan uh, Bickers. Daniel Bickers. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dan. Good morning, um, David and commission members. We also have representatives from the development team. Um, Angela Bennett and Kevin Lynn, I believe, are also on the call. We're very excited to present to you our residential development plan. This is phase one of a multi-phased um, residential development um, between Lexington and uh, Way Park Avenue, what we call the Lee Park District. As you can see from the renderings, we have two offerings at this point that comprise um, six lots, which again, we're calling phase one, where we have a 2,200 2, square foot structure to the left, a modern strategy, and they're both modern, but the 1,800 square foot offering um, really starts to speak to the vernacular of the neighborhood with the front porch. Um, we did receive the City Planning Commission um, Housing Task Force approval back in March. We also received our <clears throat> zoning variances, which were minor, um, last month. So we're in the process of seeking our building permit. And I believe this is what triggered this particular presentation before you guys. Um, we approached the project in terms of subdividing the property. Next, Maurice. You can see we consolidated the property and subdivided it into six equal parcels. And they're 38 feet, four inches um, each with, with their front, frontages. And that triggered the zoning variances that were required. But initially we were going to build five to preclude any type of uh, issues with the subdivision um, presentations. So you can move forward, Maurice. So again, just cycling through our submittals to the building department, the each of the 2,200 square foot homes are anchored or anchoring the, the development of phase one <clears throat> with four 1,800 square foot homes centrally located. You can cycle through these pretty quickly, Maurice. Okay. So you can see the strategy of basically having bookends with the larger, you can stop here, with the larger structures on both the north and south ends of this um, development piece. Again, East 65th runs north and south, obviously. You can see in our photograph the aerial, illustrating the context and our proximity to League Park. Um, with the larger structures, we'll have upper decks as an option. So we have nice vistas of the neighborhood, which has a very um, robust history. And, you know, given the pioneers of trying to move back into this neighborhood, we're very excited about 
um, that the fact that the houses are pre-sold, which sort of speaks to, you know, the fact that there's a, there's a market for these structures. With regard to the, um, the context, if you start at the bottom of each of one of the rows or columns of photos, we start at the north end of East 65th, illustrating our property to the east on the right side, which is a vacant lot. You can see the housing vernacular in image 3.0, looking north. With this particular one has a, a, a two-family house with the front porch. And then finally, there is a multifamily structure anchoring our development uh, to the north. And again, moving back to the south, you'll see that multifamily house structure in 2.0. And again, our the vacant lots that'll be consolidated and subdivided. Next, Maurice. So this further illustrates the existing configuration of the property prior to consolidating and subdividing. What's interesting about this development is there's not only East 65th Street as a residential access point, but we have an alleyway, East 66th um, Place, which provides us the opportunity to um, approach the houses vehicularly from the rear and eliminate any driveways off of East 65th Street. Next. So again, at this point, when we prepared this drawing, we weren't quite sure how we were gonna um, distribute the um, the offerings, but as you can see, the larger 2,200 square foot house to the south, they all have attached garages, two car garages, and there is a mid a, um, a private mid yard for the 2,200 square foot home. And again, we've uh, to the north, we're anchoring another 2,200 square foot. As mentioned, you can see the access from East 66 Place. Next. And again, this drawing was prepared by city architecture. As you can see, the overall comprehensive development strategy is to, again, build the homes in phase one and subsequently move to the north with additional single family structures and um, multi-family structures, townhomes and the like. So it's a very comprehensive um, residential design project, and we're very excited about the opportunity that this site presents us. Next. So we could actually go through each one of the houses um, design strategy, but if there's any questions or comments at this point, again, mentioning we've been approved by the housing subcommittee. Yeah, so Dan, we want to play to that point. Dan, we're not here for design review. Right. This is for the gotcha. lot split and lot consolidation. So, commission members? Um, I move approval. Second. We have a motion second. Further discussion? Hey, Dan, I just want to say I find both the houses you showed very attractive. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay. Call we have roll. Director Collier with his hand raised. Oh, Director? Yes. I just want to uh, emphasize uh, the uh, work of uh, the development group here. Um, one of the things that you see with this configuration is that we wanted to make sure that this was a walkable block and how the uh, designs are, are situated really takes advantage of the alleys uh, to the back, which is a really great treatment um, that promotes walkability. Um, uh, there were no front loaded garages on this, which is something that we try to avoid. Uh, citywide. So just want to emphasize that uh, this group has been working very closely uh, with the department on this. And this is on 66th Street. There's very significant importance for 66th Street, uh, given that it's really the uh, main spine that leads from uh, Euclid Corridor into the heart of the Huff community. Um, I believe Councilman Jones is also uh, on the line. Uh, but this is a project that we are all in very much uh, support of. Uh, the Cleveland Foundation and their investment on uh, in, in uh, the Euclid uh, Avenue area and uh, around 66 also uh, creates really good opportunity to connect the neighborhood uh, to the asset that is also Euclid Corridor, 
as well as League Park. So I just want to uh, express um, the importance of this uh, effort and also our uh, uh, support uh, for this endeavor. Thank you. Thanks, Director. Councilman, did you want something that, do you have something you want to add? Without a doubt. Uh, thank you so much, Chairman, um, and thank you to the commission. Uh, the community is very, very excited about this project um, to the point, as Mr. Bickerstaff stated, uh, you know, we don't have enough houses. So they'll be coming back to you soon to, to get some more lots because uh, the, so many people want to move into the neighborhood. Um, and they're really excited about this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful structures uh, to be built right, right in a place that you no know, people wouldn't expect it. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you to the, uh, to the team, Frontline Development. Thank you so much, Director Collier. Thank you to the commission uh, and Cleveland Foundation as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Abstain. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. All right. Good luck. Looking forward to seeing them up. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Uh, Permanent person number 00707029 and 030. Uh, this is uh, 2314 and 2316 West 37th Street. Who's here for this one? Hi. Right. Uh, this is Byron Bonamici uh, representing Cleveland Bricks. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm ready to begin. If, uh, right. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I apologize for the layout of the pictures. We're going to go from right to left. Um, that is the neighbor's house. <clears throat> and so our, our goal here was we wanted, we have a large parcel that's 50 feet. And then uh, we've gotten... Uh, Pre-approval for uh, acquiring a 20-foot uh, city land bank parcel, uh, which is right next to this house that you see with the red door here. And so our um, intentions are, and um, the middle picture and the left picture are um, just, uh, it, there's a chain link fence there um, on the uh, on our parcel that we plan on removing with the development. And you can uh, go to the next slide. And um, that is just more of our parcel there. You can see the uh, the stake at the end of the chain link fence and at the <clears throat> on the left hand side, uh, you can just kind of cut off there. It wasn't cut off yesterday, but um, it goes up until that tree line that you see from the end of the chain link fence to the tree line on the left hand picture. Uh, that's our 50 foot parcel and you can go to the next slide. So this is the aerial and yeah, there's the full um, extent of the parcel that you see on the left picture there. Um, and so it, it, as you can see from the aerial, our intent is to combine the um, 50 foot parcel and the uh, 20 foot parcel to then split it. Uh, what we're doing, and we worked this out with the neighbors uh, with the help of Matt Moss and uh, Terry in the land bank. We're going to split a four foot section off of the 20 foot parcel and give it to the neighbors. Uh, they'd like a driveway, a usable driveway, and the four foot is enough for them to be able to do that with their current land. Uh, and then we're going to create two 33 foot parcels for single family development. And uh, you can go to the next slide. And so these are the uh, proposed dimensions and, and layout of our um, future development. Um, we've come to an agreement with uh, city planning on the layout uh, and how they like it. Um, and we also wanted to accommodate the neighbors with the four foot split uh, that you see there. Uh, 
we can go to the next slide unless there are any questions. And this is our uh, final lot split um, that we're seeking approval for today. Thank Coming you. to the applicant, I'm not totally, I don't understand what the four foot section is. Is it, is it an easement? Is it, is it gonna revert back to the other property owner? I'm not really sure what that means. So yes, um, there's, there's gonna be three separate legal descriptions created from the split. Uh, that four foot parcel is going to be completely independent and then it's going to uh, be consolidated with the neighbors. We're, we're giving it to the neighbors uh, and it'll become part of their parcel. Thank you. Thank you. But they'll be responsible for the consolidation. Um, this is Lillian. Um, I'd like to move approval on thank you. I mean, I think this is sometimes we get lot splits for my opinion that I don't make a lot of sense. Um, I think this is a really excellent um, thing to do for the neighbors and to get two houses and also the rear loaded garages. So um, thank you very much. And I move approval. Second. No. Okay. We have a motion second for the discussion. Hearing none, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slay. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, per person number 002, 31095 and 049, 5408, Ithaca Court. Who's here for this one? We have Chad Jones from Cleveland Bricks, I believe. Go ahead, Chad. Yes. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. Uh, I want to say first off, um, this is, I work for Cleveland Bricks, but this is actually for me, not, not has nothing to do with Cleveland Bricks. Um, and thank you all for hearing this out. So I actually live next to this parcel, uh, these parcels. And if you want to scroll down, you can see the current state of this house uh, as it has been. There's an overhead view. So this, uh, you can kind of go through those. There's not much there. This is in the Detroit Shoreway uh, neighborhood, part of the Eco Village on 54th and Ithaca Court. So um, this, what, what I needed to do in order to get funding to purchase this through the bank was to consolidate these lots. Um, there's two, two parcels there, the house was on one and then the yard basically was on the other. And, um, it was split, I believe, in the 80s. Nobody for a long time had known who to, who owned the house or could get a hold of the owner. I happened to meet him this uh, earlier this summer. If you see right there, the house directly above the 5408 Ithaca Court is where I current is where I live. Um, my plan, of course, is to purchase this lot to um, to tear down this house or to stabilize it if that is at all possible. Um, I'm pretty sure that. You know, uh, Councilman Zone, I believe, is probably familiar with this house. I did talk to Adam Davenport. He is very familiar with the house as well. It's It's been an eyesore. Uh, the plan moving forward would be for me to purchase this lot and my house and to then have a yard, um, you know, a yard and, and just to get rid of this problem house. Thank you. Matt, I saw you were on the phone. Are you still there? I am. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first time I'm seeing this, so um, I'm unfamiliar. It, Mr. Um, Chad, uh, Mr. Jones is absolutely right. The house is an eyesore. It's a lovely little court. It's in the heart of the Cleveland Eco Village. We have our Eco Village Community Garden just down this area. Um, I would be supportive contingent upon this being uh, built out as an owner occupied situation. So I understand if absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I have no opposition. All right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, commission members. I move approval downing. Second. Like we have a motion and second further discussion. Hearing none, call the roll, please. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. 
Yes. Slide. Yes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Two townhouse in a two family district. Permanent parcel number 007, 08, 178, and 119. This is for Fulton Road townhomes. Who do we have for this? Michael Horton with Horton Park Architects. Hey, Michael. Go ahead, please. Okay. I'll go to the next slide. So uh, we are working with Cleveland Bricks on the site uh, for the Fulton Road townhomes, uh, which occur in between Forest Court and Monroe Avenue along Fulton Road. Uh, you can see the site location on the aerial here. And uh, we recognize that we're here pretty early. Um, we view with only uh, site plans with, um, with an idea of how the parcels would be split and configured. But, um, we think that's a good thing. We want to get feedback uh, before we took the project to the next stage. Um, we just want to get an understanding of uh, you know, this type of density, uh, if organized uh, correctly, that is acceptable um, to the planning commission. So if we take a look at the aerial view here, um, you can see that we're kind of right at the, the threshold here of, um, you know, when heading northbound into Ohio City, it's kind of the gateway. Um, across the street, we've got the little cemetery. On the other side of Siam, there is some new development. It's a bit of a gated burial, um, but there are some uh, new uh, single family homes on the corner. Uh, on the corner of Monroe and Fulton, we have the Scrapcom Scrapyard. Um, and on the other end of Forest Court, we do have a, um, you can see up in the top right corner. We've got a commercial structure that goes right up to the property line along Fulton. At the bottom right corner, this is a view looking north along Fulton. As you turn down Monroe, it goes down to uh, single family residences. And that, uh, that single family residence directly adjacent is a two story with a gable roof. So, you know, we're approximately 25 feet in height there. Um, if we could move to the next slide, we could show you what we are proposing. So on the left, you can see the current configuration of the parcels and what is existing. We do have a single family residence um, directly adjacent to the parcel on the row. And there's another single family residence, which technically has a row address, but it, uh, you know, it has a little bit more frontage on Forest Court. Um, so over to the right, the idea is to uh, find a way to bring residential density to the neighborhood, but minimize the amount of curb cuts. Uh, we did have a site plan previously. It actually had a curb cut off of Monroe. Um, we shared that with um, OCI and Ben Trimble, and you know, uh, rightly so there were some concerns about sight lines and having cars go in and out. Um, given, given the proximity of that uh, adjacent residence at 32, 3412 Monroe, it was really hard to, uh, Hard to see pedestrian uh, traffic along the sidewalk. Uh, so we reconfigured this to uh, for a three townhome scheme. All the entrances are along Fulton, and there's one curb cut off of Forest Court. Uh, we wanted to uh, provide enough vehicular maneuverability so cars could pull in facing forward into their garages and then back out of the garage, turn around. And, and pull out facing forward so there are adequate sight lines um, bring the car going in. Um, all entrances would be off of Fulton, we would have sort of a recessed stoop porch. Um, and we do have active habitable living space on the first floor for each one as well. Um, the, the townhouse that is on the corner of Fulton and Monroe has a much larger footprint, which gives us some flexibility on that third floor, because these would be two-story townhomes, to start to step down the roof line. So um, it is a little bit, uh, you know, the scale is uh, you know, more contextual for the single-family residences along the row. Uh, this, this development would adhere to the townhouse code. Uh, another issue that, that we would Articulate advance, so we're mindful of is that we do have garages um, 
you know, facing Fulton, and those would be addressed on the facade with glazing and, you know, and uh, you know, articulated, well detailed fire, um, so as to not you know, have those faces appear to be the right wall. So, um, really, we're here to to just to get this in front of the, the planning commission and see if this is a you know, should we when we do come back in front of HDRS and the block club. Uh, they were actually meeting this month, but we will present this to them um, with more detailed plans. We want to make sure that this level of density um, is adequate, given that we do have a town, we do have townhouse use in the city district. That's all. Open Thank you. Questions. Commission members? Um, I mean, I, I see that uh, my perspective. Um, uh, I think that the rear loaded access drive works and, um, and I think that, um, I'm okay with this. I, I would have liked to just see a massing just because it, to understand it. So I don't know if you have one by chance. Um, is there a massing for this? Yeah. Okay. But no, uh, not, on this, not on this presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah. but, uh, I move approval. Second. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Hooker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Good luck. Um, thank you. I think we have to take out of order here under the mandatory referrals. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, director, but Dave Ebersall has a meeting he has to go to. So are we doing the TIF ordinance numbers uh, 751-2020? Uh, yes. Okay, so the mayor and supply to acquire and reconvey <laughs> properties presently owned by CC Superior Companies <laughs> LLC. <laughs> Put the city in the chain of titles for a TEF. Go ahead, David. Great, thank you for um, uh, taking this for me. I appreciate it. Um, this this would authorize us to enter into the chain of title for a non-school TIF. Um, this project is uh, for the um, location of Cross Country Mortgage to um, downtown Cleveland on uh, 21st Street and Superior. Um, they're uh, they've outgrown their space in the suburbs and are going to be moving. Um, downtown, uh, bringing um, over 400 jobs to the city. Um, we also have some uh, forgivable loan and, and job creation grant funding into this project as well. Um, but this is this is a great opportunity. They're gonna do a uh, mixed use development with their headquarters, uh, historic rehab. They're applying for historic tax credits of these buildings. And it'll be a great thing for uh, Superior Avenue once, once they move down here. Um, and and get moving. So uh, this is the first step in, in implementing a TIF on the property, um, and we're really excited to to be moving this forward. Thank you, David. Uh, commission members, move approval. Downing. Second. Paul. We have a motion. And a second. Further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luther. Yes. Curry. Lillian, are you there? Sorry, yes. Apologize. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. So resolution number 691-2020, declaring the intent to vacate portions of 66th Street Place extending from Lexington Avenue to Quibi Avenue. Who's here for this one? We have Rick Swatalski. Hey, Rick. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Good, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Uh, yes, so if you go to the next slide, please, we can see where the uh, intended vacation is to be. One more. Thank you. Uh, the Cleveland Public Library is in the process of designing a new Huff branch that will be built on the property that they intend to acquire from the City Land Bank at the corner of East 66th Street and Lexington Avenue. 
There's an alleyway called East 66 Place that runs north and south between Lexington and Quimby Avenues. The parcel of the Cleveland Public Library intends to acquire are located on either side of East 66 Place. The alley is no longer being used for access as it is unimproved. And you can actually see a site plan if we go to the next slide, please. So with that, we're requesting uh, authorization to move forward. Thank you, Rick. Um, how about utilities down 66? Are there utilities going down there? And how uh, do you plan on addressing that? If there are utilities within any type of vacated area, they re they retain an easement through that area. So they can always come back and work on their utilities. That's common to any type of vacation that is done. Yeah, I know. I, I just, sometimes the muses don't have any utilities. I just didn't know if you knew if they did or did. At this particular 66 place, I do not know if you wish to get that information. We can make an inquiry. Oh, that's all right. I was just wondering. All right. Have, uh, Mr. Bowen, we also have uh, Director Collier with his hand raised. Director. I just, just want to call into uh, the strategic importance of 66 Street. Um, and this is further uh, uh, illustrates how uh, critical 66th Street is with this uh, institutional uh, development. Um, again, 66th Street will become uh, the main spine uh, leading into Huff uh, from the south and extending north. So I just want to call your attention and keep your attention on the strategic importance of 66th Street because there will be more to come uh, with respect to uh, land development and also uh, infrastructure items uh, before the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Commission members? Approval. Downing. Luker. Second. Slide. Okay, we have a motion to second. Further discussion? Hearing none, uh, call the roll. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slide. Yes. Thank you. Good luck, Rick. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, everyone. Um, the next one is 2020. Um, this one was tabled. This is for a tree commission. And um, before we get asked for it to come off the table, Director, do we have some? Is is this going to be presented today? And why is there a tree commission? So, just to provide just a little bit of a context here, um, this was actually uh, introduced and has been a uh, review by the administration. Uh, we have Jason Wood on the line, who's going to outline um, the administration's position with respect to this particular piece. Uh, so, okay. Mr. Wood, I believe, is on the line and he has a presentation. Okay, so uh, so we are going to hear something. So, first, we have to take it off the table. Um, so, can I get a motion? I move to take it off the table. Downing. Second. We have a motion second. Uh, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. August. August. He said yes. I did. Okay, I couldn't hear him. Curry? Yes. Paul? Yes. Slight? Yes. All right, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, as Director Collier mentioned, my name is Jason Woodham, the city's chief of sustainability. Um, also, Director Cox and Chief Brown as well. They've been pretty actively involved. If we've done our internal review. Um, I, I think I'll, you know, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I think this all starts from a good place and that we're all committed to reestablishing the tree canopy in the city of Cleveland. I think we all know and recognize that there are some challenges associated with that and that trees do have a pretty impactful benefit um, from a, a long term planning and quality of life standpoint in our neighborhood. And I've got some of the benefits that we always talk about listed here, but if you can jump to the next slide. Um, you can see that these aren't just intangible kind of value statements. There's real actual economic and, and, and measurable benefit here. So our canopy, as you can see, really helps us produce environmental benefits in excess of $11 million every year. Um, the carbon storage has a $26 million impact over the lifetime of the canopy. 
And we also see some pretty positive health outcomes. So nearly $3.7 million of avoided negative health impacts um, can be traced back to having the tree canopy that we have now. So we're all committed to kind of continuing that effort and really helping grow that. Uh, if you can jump to the next slide, I think where we want to have some conversation around the tree commission is, is, is how does this fit into the overall kind of coordinated approach that we've developed over time? So there is currently a tree commission outlined in Cleveland codified ordinance. It's in 163.01.03, but it has effectively been dormant since as best as we can trace, and, and Director Cox certainly has more institutional memory on this than, than I do, it has effectively been dormant since the early 2000s. Uh, we think, and as we kind of look through this, there are several factors that have kind of gotten us to this point. Um, I think since originally kind of put in place the the professionalization level of the urban forestry staff has been increased pretty significantly. We've reached a point now where all of our city foresters are um, certified um, arborists under the International Society of Arboriculture. Um, so we've kind of brought in more people. Our, our current manager in this section is also um, a, a qualified risk assessor, so a tree risk assessor um, qualification. So we've brought in an increasing amount of res uh, resources into our urban forestry. We've also increased kind of the level of professional qualification that they have. I think we've also looked kind of, um, if you look back during this interim period where this commission has been dormant, we've created the Office of Sustainability, which has really been focused on kind of the environmental side of this um, and really trying to link and facilitate coordination and collaboration between the various groups that are kind of active in this space and really trying to help develop some of the long-term planning and that long-term planning has been undergoing for several years now. I think we can trace back probably the most significant effort to 2015 when um, we coordinated the development of the Cleveland Tree Plan. We brought together 25 organizations who are working in and around this space to really try to put some structure to all of that work um, and really try to create um, some tangible goals. And I think we've, we've through the, the Tree Coalition process, which is a separate entity, um, established a goal of 30% canopy by 2040. That's been adopted by the city into the climate action plan. Um, I, I think we do have to be somewhat honest with ourselves about that, that there are some challenges related to funding, um, planning locations, the ability to, to meet that through public planning versus private planning, um, the availability of tree inventory, um, the actual number of trees. Do we have enough in the region to meet that goal? Um, but we're, we're working through that. We've also seen a pretty significant increase in funding, um, particularly in the last year. Um, for this, we have added, uh, Mayor Jackson committed to adding an additional million dollars of funding for tree planning on an annual basis for the next 10 years, which is significantly increasing our ability to kind of get that planning done. I think for five years before this year, we were averaging about 400 trees planted a year. Um, with this, we'll be able to ramp that up kind of as we look at um, to almost 2,000 trees this year, um, and that will kind of be the consistent pace moving forward. And I think since kind of the early 2000s, we've seen an expanded community commitment to preservation. We've got more organizations working in this space very actively to try to make some progress, and, and that requires a lot of coordination. And I mentioned the Tree Coalition in passing there, but the, the Cleveland Tree Coalition is really an organization that has evolved to help with some of that coordination and really has taken on some of the critical roles uh, related to the integration between what we do on the public side versus the private side planning is really going to have to play a critical role in fundraising. Um, I mentioned that 30% by 2040 goal for canopy coverage. Um, that's going to require the planting of about 30,000 trees a year. And if we look at that strictly through public planning costs, that's about a 12 to $15 million investment that will be required there. So we are going to have to take a look at fundraising um, and then also facilitating, facilitating some of the public education dimensions. So if we can skip to the next one, just for background, the Tree Coalition, um, I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see here. Uh, on the left, you have kind of the executive committee members of the Tree Coalition. So you have the City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, the Metro Parks, Trust for Public Land, uh, Western Reserve Land Conservancy, Environmental Health Watch, the Sewer District, Holden Forest and Gardens, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. But as we've started this, it's grown and it's expanded. So you see kind of on the right side, and then all of the members who have signed on to be members of the Tree Coalition. So. In total, we've got about 40 organizations who are working through this process to kind of work um, very aggressively and very collaboratively to restore the tree canopy in Cleveland. So if you kind of jump to the next one, I think some of our kind of more general concerns with the ordinance as it's drafted is that the long-term planning has really kind of been underway for quite some time and it's incurred with input from multiple stakeholders. So as I mentioned, we put the Cleveland tree plan together initially in 2015. 
Um, it's been updated a little bit earlier this year, so we kind of have some sense of where we've gone, where we've made progress and kind of those next steps. As we look at the tree commission, is this going to insert another organization into something that's already fairly complicated and collaborative? Um, we, we established in the tree plan in 2015 this goal of uh, establishing a unified voice and formalizing partnerships, and we worked very diligently over the last five to six years to really do that. So that unified voice, we've kind of focused that on our internal processes. So all of the internal city agencies and departments, whether that's sustainability, urban forestry, public works, coordination with CPP around trimming, um, looking at how we do that kind of internal process in, in, in a unified fashion, and then really utilizing that tree coalition process to formalize some of those external partnerships as well. Um, the duties outlined, um, some of these are outlined in the existing 16301, and some are new to the, the, what's being proposed, but a lot of them are already underway. Um, so completing a tree inventory, for example, we, we're looking through our own internal data as we looked out into the public space on what the, the, the cost would be to do a full tree inventory and assessment. We came back with estimates into a wide range, and I apologize for the, 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 the wideness of it, um, between 500000 and a million dollars. So what we wanted to do was take a look and dig through our own internal data. We track all of this. Our, our, our foresters are collecting data on all of our trees through their normal course of business um, to the, the ANSI A300 level, um, which is kind of the industry standard that we want to pursue here. Um, we have data on 77,000 trees, so we want to evaluate that, do a little QAQC so we can fully understand the scope and the breadth of what we have to do so we can more effectively use that money as opposed to taking it away from planning to do an inventory when it's going to be re repeating work that's already done. The canopy goal I've talked a little bit about. Um, I've mentioned some of the increases we've seen in planning. We've also have shifted to an equity focused model for planning. So as we're trying to kind of look at the structure of where we plant trees and how we do it, we're trying to tie it into places where we know are deficient um, from a canopy coverage standpoint. And we've spent a lot of time and effort kind of aligning our preservation, maintenance and trimming standards as much as possible with industry standards. So we try to follow the NCA 300, the ISA best management practices model. So a lot of what's outlined here has kind of already taken place. Um, the law department also does have a few concerns um, in terms of how these duties go beyond an advisory function um, and have the ability to potentially commit resources outside of our normal administrative and legislative processes. And then that's a minor thing, but we weren't completely clear as we read through this on whether it applies to public or private trees. Oh, um, so with that, I think I'll stop. I could go on and on and on, and, but I think um, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, answer any questions that there may be. Commissioner members, question. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, uh, we had uh, Councilman uh, McCormick with his hand raised earlier. Councilman, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? I can. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's good to see my former colleagues on the uh, planning commission. Um, although Councilman Slythe is a lot smarter um, and hard, harder working than I am, um, I do miss seeing you all. And so it's good to see everyone this morning. Um, and, and thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing the time here to to say a few words about this this ordinance. Um, Councilman Casey and I are the the co-sponsors on this ordinance, and I want to just kind of give a brief overview of why we're so excited about this ordinance and happy that you're hearing it today along its legislative path through council. So the tree commission, um, which as uh, the chief noted, uh, has been established for quite a while, uh, but has failed to be active due to the lack of appointees to it. Um, what Councilman Casey are excited about is reestablishing this commission um, to bring in the community into the of Cleveland. Um, we're, you know, very excited about the larger uh, partnerships around reforestation throughout the region. Um, and we know that it is in critically important that residents um, and experts here in the city of Cleveland um, have a role in the way that we're reforesting the city of Cleveland and have a voice in that process. So that is really why we're excited um, about this ordinance. Uh, we know that uh, there is no time to waste, Mr. Chairman, when it comes to climate change. Uh, we're not waiting for it. It's not on the horizon. It is here. And one of the most fundamental aspects of fighting climate change is making sure that we are reforesting our city. Um, and that's why it's exciting that uh, we are taking on these types of initiatives. Um, the bottom line here, Mr. Chairman, is that um, there's work to do in the city of Cleveland. 
um, as we think about reforestation. We know that we've made some great progress around uh, allocating dollars to plant new trees, uh, but we know that there, is, there are still a lot of issues when it comes to um, our ability to maintain our canopy in the city of Cleveland. Um, you know, I'll use one example, Mr. Chairman, of a tragedy that I would characterize in Ward 3. Uh, the Fulton Road project, which was a great investment of $9 million, um, because of the lack of pre-planning for that project, when it came to forestry, uh, we had to remove 50 healthy, mature trees along the corridor. So, uh, you know, that is an example of where kind of the system, quite frankly, failed to really take into account the importance of our trees and to protect them in the process. So, you know, we absolutely must aggressively plant trees and we're working as hard as we can to do that. But just as important is to protect the existing healthy canopy uh, that we have. And we know that's been an issue throughout the city of Cleveland. Um, so this ordinance, what it does is it, it uh, as we should be seeking, uh, is uh, it brings in the smartest people in our community to help us advance the goals of the uh, Department of Sustainability, of uh, reforesting our city uh, by bringing on um, an internal and external experts on tree canopy uh, and tree preservation and how to best reforest our city. Um, this is a best practice that we've seen uh, cities across America do. Uh, our, our counterparts in Pittsburgh and other cities have these active commissions that support the work of the city of Cleveland, or their, excuse me, their respective city uh, when it comes to the, the canopy. So uh, again, Chair, this has been a thoroughly researched and thought out process. Um, uh, I will say that I believe though, I wasn't on the last call uh, or the last planning commission meeting where this was heard, uh, but it's my understanding that it was postponed to allow for conversation uh, between the administration and council. Uh, this is the first time, Mr. Chairman, that I am seeing this presentation. Um, I was not contacted by anyone in the administration to discuss this ordinance, and I believe my co-sponsor was not either. Um, I, of course, I am always willing to, to sit down and to discuss the merits or uh, details of an ordinance with the administration, and I still welcome that opportunity. Um, but for logistical purposes, we were not contacted to discuss this ordinance. So this is the first time I'm seeing this information. Um, and again, I'm always happy along this process uh, to meet with Chief Wood or anyone else that would like to discuss this ordinance. Uh, but again, to me, what this does, Mr. Chairman, is it uh, brings in a, a group of community experts to support the work of reforesting the city of Cleveland. It's a best practice that we've seen cities across America adopt. Uh, and this ordinance has been uh, thought out and vetted through uh, our partners in the community and with our legal staff as well. So um, again, an important piece to ensure that the city of Cleveland is doing everything it can to uh, fight climate change here in the city and ensure that we're not only planting new trees, uh, but that we are protecting the existing healthy canopy that we have, uh, which has kind of been a problem throughout the city, especially when it comes to the public right of way and infrastructure investments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we have just Fluker with his hand raised and Councilman Brancatelli. Well, here, so we're mute. Here. there's a lot of background noise going on. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, um, just before we go to Fluker, um, Councilman, since you're still on the phone, Carrie, if you remember when you were on planning, we talked about um, a tree bank. And, you know, I think that, that would be an interesting philosophy where there's uh, trees that are taken down or trees that are um, uh, not needed for a specific project. If you go into the bank and then go to other places, it's used. So um, I think you might remember that when you were on the planning commission. But Flicker, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, two points. The first point is, as I recall, we tabled this particular um, request because the administration and council had not communicated. And it appears that appears to be the, the issue here as well. Secondly, and, uh, and more importantly, there needs to be a consolidated effort. So the, the, there's a continuum, and I'll give you an example because I don't like generalizing. Uh, we don't need a lot of armchair quarterbacks out there deciding what trees stay, what street trees go, and that's what's been happening. 
um, whether it's at on the planning level, whether it's at community development level, whether it's you know somebody uh, a, a developer telling us what 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 should or should not happen, and I, I just don't think that has been totally vetted and, and figured out, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Who's next? We had Councilman Brancatelli next. Councilman, all right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and um, I certainly appreciate. Uh, 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 Chief Wood's presentation, um, and as uh, Councilman McCormick stated, is the first that we're seeing in that council. Um, and I understand, you know, that the mayor released uh, uh, notice yesterday that uh, uh, there's free trees on a first come, first serve basis to be planted as part of our uh, improving our tree canopy. Um, this was a uh, um, part of our budget uh, requests at the beginning of the year to set aside a million dollars for the next ten years, as uh, Chief Wood spoke about. Um, but uh, that just also speaks to the communications um, that's not occurring because we were not aware that that was uh, uh, that press release was going. It wasn't a press release; it was part of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic press release. Um, the uh, I think the Tree Commission, um, as uh, the councilman spoke, um, it was a longstanding commission, and as uh, uh, Chief Woods uh, stated, um, over the years where the Urban Forestry Department had been gutted. Um, uh, the tree commission was part of that gutting. Um, and I think uh, now that we're getting fully staffed and brought in a number of arborists and um, that, that that division has really stepped up in a, in a big way. Um, the tree, tree canopy issue is an important issue across the city and uh, certainly having uh, 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 other folks meeting outside of city hall um, is important. And uh, I had sat in some of those tree commission meetings. Um, I think having a, a tree commission um, in City Hall as part of our structure um, is incredibly important. I think having um, the ability to, to get these professionals um, very specific about the City of Cleveland um, and, and what our Tree Commission looks like, um, uh, I think is a, is a re reinstating what had been a long tradition um, uh, is, is very important to us. So um, certainly support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Worries? Yes, we have uh, Councilman Slife and Councilman Casey next. Go ahead, Councilman. Uh, Dave, I'm, Slife, happy to, yes. I'm happy to go after Councilman Casey since he's a sponsor of the order. Okay. Councilman Casey. Thank, thank you, Councilman, and, and thank you, members of the commission. Um, uh, just to follow up on Councilman uh, McCormick and uh, Brancatelli, uh, we're not really trying to reinvent the wheel and we're not trying to be um, another spoke or or the missing spoke in, in a wheel that uh, is already existing. This is something that was uh, introduced uh, that we were working on for over a year. Uh, as Fluker indicated, we tabled it for the administration to have conversation with us for a month and we heard nothing. The closest we came was a conversation between myself and Director Collier. However, it wasn't specifically regarding this piece of legislation, it was how we should all be communicating and working together. Um, but as far as the administration, um, this is, the again, the first time I'm seeing anything like this. Uh, I know the council is very supportive of this legislation. And again, we're not here to take the place of the coalition. We're here to um, worry about the, the city of Cleveland, the tree canopy, uh, and, and the commission goes much or, or the tree commission would go much deeper to that. Right. I mean, we've got, you know, broken sidewalks due to trees. We have infrastructure that's falling apart. We have people um, who are um, being charged thousands and thousands. You know, for city trees. And hopefully this commission will kind of look at all of that together and, and help solve the problem working with the administration and not against them. So, again, I'm a co-sponsor and I'm 100% in, um, in, in support of this legislation and it moving out of the planning commission and, and going to uh, city council. Thank you. Councilman Slife. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'm, I, I'm not an attorney, but uh, people think I am. So on, in that spirit, um, I, you know, I'm looking at the chapter 163 with uh, which, you know, speaks to the tree commission. And, and to me, you know, the duties or the organization, you know, it says the mayor shall appoint a chairperson and it shall meet once a month and it shall adopt rules. So to me, it's it's not just 
it's not that we're reinventing the wheel, it's that we're working to implement the law. And, you know, it's very honorable. They do great work, the Cleveland Tree Coalition. Uh, but to me, a lot of that focus is macro, high level planning. And what we deal with as council members is, uh, you know, those instances that Councilman Casey referred to, these more micro specific, you know, a resident that's now looking at their third time going through the 50 50 tree pro or 50 50 sidewalk program because the tree keeps buckling the sidewalk and is frustrated because there's uh, seemingly no transparency uh, that's easy to understand on, um, you know, how it's determined if the tree gets removed or not. And, and I, I alluded to this in our last meeting, but uh, there really is a consensus among many residents that you know, having a tree in the tree lawn is not uh, ornamental and nice, but it's a source of frustration and anxiety uh, that uh, could cost people a lot of money and uh, people don't have, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to fix sewer lines and repair sidewalks and driveways. Um, it's not to say that we should be removing trees, but uh, by having a more transparent public process through a tree commission, I think that that provides uh, that, you know, that's an important value to our residents and allows us to uh, better navigate through not just the planting and maintenance of trees, but also all of the externalities that kind of derive from having uh, trees in a urban environment. So, you know, for that reason, you know, I, I, I believe that there's value in passing this through planning commission as well and uh, moving it, you know, towards, uh, you know, the further along in the legislative process. Thank you, Councilman. Chairman Bowen, we have uh, Jason Wood, Councilman Zone, and August Fluker in that order. And Director Collier just, just raised his hand. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no. Just start all over again. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the, the time as chairman and members of the commission and, and to all the council members on the phone. And I think um, I, I would defer on some of the issues regarding tree damage sidewalk to uh, Chief Brown and Director Cox. They're, they're obviously much more familiar with that part of the process than I am. But I think Councilman Slife and his 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 comments there hit on something that links back to something that Councilman Brancatelli actually raises, this notion that to a lot of residents, there is this concern. So this um, this opportunity for residents to request trees really opened up because of the number of refusals that we get. So as we go through our tree placement process, we do give up residents the opportunity to opt out of having a tree planted in their in their tree lawn. Um, we see a decent number of refusals from that. Um, so there is certainly something to that notion that we have to really work hard to find the locations for all of these trees. Um, and that's why we opened up that process that Councilman Brancatelli referenced. But I don't know if, if Chief Brown or, or Director Cox want to address the tree damage sidewalk um, issues that Councilman Casey raised. I'll, I'll leave that to them to do so. We then had uh, Councilman Zone, August, and Director Collier. Okay, great. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, remind my colleagues on the phone that trees are infrastructure. Too often we think about a raised sidewalk and they would sacrifice a 40 year old tree that probably has another 200 years left just to fix a sidewalk that might last 15 years. So um, I would say slow your roll on uh, how we approach trees. We need to exhaust all efforts as a municipal entity to save, um, maintain, and plant as many trees as possible. You know, for over a decade, I've been funding a ward reforestation tree program because the city, previously to our commitment, uh, our announcement of a million dollars a year for the next 10 years, um, was not giving out free street trees. I've been planting trees in Ward 15 for over a decade. Um, I've done a lot of policy work in this space uh, around the tree preservation ordinance that this planning commission approved with accommodation um, I've yet to, to see how, how that is playing out, but it, its uh, main intent is to save trees at all efforts. Um, the, the, the other component to this is, is just kind of the lack of communication. Um, you hear the front sense of frustration from my colleagues on council because we're not getting clear messages and it seems like there is not a clear, logical, transparent process on how decisions are made with respect to trees. So we can throw a lot of money at a program like this, but unless we can 
function it and operate it and maintain that we're sharing information in real time, um, it's only going to be as successful as the implementation. Um, the last comment I will make is that um, uh, Chief Woods did a good presentation and overview of, of the complexity of, of our tree canopy. Um, and, and, and as a result, this tree coalition has set out a very ambitious goal to um, increase that canopy and raise a considerable amount of money. Uh, probably we've committed, we have 20% or 20 million committed of a $100 million endeavor. So we have a lot more, uh, a lot farther way to go. Um, some of you heard the news about me transitioning from city council. Um, I will be um, uh, going to the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. The, the tree coalition now is going to, um, uh, the Western Reserve Land Conservancy is going to become the fiscal agent and uh, they're going to hire an executive director and that individual will report to me. So uh, I would welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with my colleagues as well as uh, all the appropriate people in the administration to see how we move forward with the ultimate goal is to save trees, to um, treat trees and inoculate them when they're needed, to trim trees, and to share information in real time with the community so there's a, a great communication and lack of frustration moving forward. I pledge to everyone on this phone that I will do that in my new role. Um, and uh, I'm neutral about this legislation moving forward. Great comments, Matt. Um, Mr. Bowen, we have, just to remind you, we have Director Collier next, and uh, Darnell Brown has also raised his hand. Hey, um, I was, I, you, you skipped me, Maurice. I was next. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Fluker. Um, I concur with the Councilman Zone. And again, the, one of the other questions that were ra was raised when we tabled this last was who owns it? Who's going to enforce it? Is it going to be 19 council people? I don't really understand how this structure is going to be beneficial if it's just simply another layer of bureaucracy. Right. So I'm just trying to understand what this all means because no one's answered that. We've had we've been talking about trees, but right. we haven't talked about how it gets enforced, who yes. owns it, and who's the bottom line. Thank you. Okay, director. Yes. Reiterate something that's been discussed, and I'm uh, I tend to agree uh, with uh, August, and uh, and also concur with uh, Jason Woods' uh, presentation. There obviously needs to be more work done, and I'm not certain if a question is the answer to all of that. One dynamic I want to. Uh, add in with respect to this discussion is when we talk about bureaucratic layers, um, when we think about all of the principles of health, equity, sustainability, these things that the administration and everyone values, I think the uh, challenge that often occurs is how they are A, implemented, administered, and enforced. And that's a very complex thing. And I think there needs to be a lot of thought put into that. But one component when we talk about this layering, uh, we deal with development projects day in and day out. Our procedures are democratic and necessary, but they're also complex. And when we think about adding, you know, uh, layers of complexity to that, you know, it, it also exposes us with our respect to efficiency. So I think there needs to be a, uh, a lot of thought given to the solution. Uh, from you know my uh, standpoint, not certain um, because again I got the opportunity to digest this uh, with some of my colleagues a little bit more, and I'm not sure that this is the answer. Um, so I just wanted to put that you know on the record and um, you know just state uh, the fact that there there this there needs to be more work. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the committee, just a couple of comments. Uh, there was mention uh, about sidewalks, uh, tree trimming, and I just would like to state for the record, just so the uh, committee is, is aware that 
we did a, what we call a tree damage sidewalk pi uh, pilot a number of years ago in wards one and wards three. As a result of that, we implemented uh, a tree damage sidewalk program that actually follows our resurfacing program. So every street that we resurface in the city of Cleveland, uh, the uh, we also go down that street the next year and we uh, fix all non-compliant sidewalks uh, that are, are there. We also do tree trimming. We added that to the program last year. So we're doing tree trimming and non-compliant sidewalks as a part and parcel of our um, uh, uh, quality of life initiatives related to our, our citywide uh, street resurfacing program, uh, which has gone from doing, uh, you know, uh, 20, 30 streets a year uh, to over 100 streets a year each year. So that's one way that we decided uh, uh, to have a, uh, an effective strategy on how to address those issues and concerns. As far as um, uh, the tree commission is concerned. One of one of the elements that my colleague uh, Chief Wood uh, mentioned early on in this presentation uh, is the whole concern around uh, capacity and the ability of tree nurseries to uh, maintain or provide to us a level of resource that's, that's required. Even the work that uh, 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 that uh, the tree coalition set out to do sets a lofty goal, but the ability for uh, uh, nurseries in the region to provide the level of uh, infrastructure, as Council, uh, Councilman Zome uh, mentioned, uh, it would be a challenge. It's, it's just not doable. So working through a strategy, which is what our existing staff is doing uh, in urban forestry to determine uh, both capacity and resource and uh, uh, type uh, of, of trees in terms of species, et cetera. Uh, you mentioned the healthiness of our street tree canopy, whether uh, unfortunately many locations where their own type of tree was planted on a, in, a, in a street or a neighborhood. Uh, and as a result, uh, that's why we have a lot of uh, sidewalks buckling, et cetera. The uh, tree line was too narrow should, and been planted there. So there's a lot of work that we have to do, uh, but we've done uh, that work in regards to uh, the next thing that I would mention, which is uh, just uh, just tree inventory. Uh, even in the ordinance as proposed, it proposes to do uh, 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 a tree inventory. Well, tree inventory, uh, just legislating it doesn't get it done. It costs money. Where's the funding for that? Uh, and we, we tackled this issue about a year ago and determined that it would take upwards of a million dollars uh, to do a uh, tree inventory, and that's just in the city of Cleveland uh, right away. Uh, again, the ordinance as proposed uh, doesn't determine whether or not uh, we're talking about street trees in the right of way, or we're talking about uh, trees on private property. So there's just some inherent issues with this thing. And so the issue of uh, understanding how inventory works, what we determine uh, by looking at our resources is that, hey, we had a number of databases uh, that had uh, uh, inventory uh, inventory aspects in it. We figured out how to import that into a CityWorks application, and we've got about 80% of what it takes to do a citywide image. So we, we're, what I'm saying is, in many respects, we're already doing this work, uh, but we're doing it as a part and parcel of uh, the enhancement and development uh, of the uh, Division of Urban Forestry uh, as we move forward. And, and and the last thing is just uh, I'm just concerned about adding yet another layer uh, and, and a process that we already have several layers and processes in place uh, to get this work done. So I'm I'm just concerned that uh, here we go again trying to create something to solve a problem that we're already dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mr. Bowen, we have Councilman McCormick. Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate that. And, and I should have stated in my prior comments, um, you know, we, I, I work with the Department of Urban Forestry on a regular basis, uh, and we've got an exceptional group of folks uh, from uh, Ms. Kip all the way down with her team. Um, so I just wanted to be clear that by no means is this a reflection um, on urban forestry or their team. They've got a great team. They're extremely responsive. They care. They're trained. I mean, I have 
I can go on about how great of a team we have. So I just want to make sure, Mr. Chairman, that I have that on the record. Um, at the end of the day, Mr. Chairman, this is about oversight. Um, you know, and I believe that a government functions best when there is light shined on what it is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think that this commission that is being proposed that used to exist is a way to provide transparency and oversight on the procedures going on uh, at the city of Cleveland when it pertains to street trees. For example, the tree damage sidewalk program is probably one of the leading causes we cut down healthy trees in the city of Cleveland um, because when we remove the sidewalk, we cut the roots and then therefore destabilize the tree. That's just an anecdotal example, but thinking creatively of how we can come up with different uh, sidewalk materials to save trees, right? That's one example of what this type of support and oversight can provide for the city of Cleveland. So um, council people, we spend 95% of our time uh, navigating the bureaucracy on behalf of our residents because they didn't get what they needed to get done. So trust me, not a single council person on this call is going to advocate to add more work to their plate. Um, we have to navigate the bureaucracy every single day of our lives. It's the majority of our job. A trash can wasn't delivered. A pothole needs to be fixed. You name it, we get the calls um, and that. So trust me, there is not a single council person that's looking to add uh, anything to their plate when it comes to navigating bureaucracy. Mr. Chairman, this is about oversight. Uh, this is about transparency. Uh, and this is about bringing the community together to support the city, not to be contrarian, to, to support the work that the city is doing uh, when it comes to uh, increasing and maintaining our tree canopy. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. You know, I think I'm going to cut this off just because we have other matters and um, I wasn't at the first meeting where they originally tabled it. It seems like there's some more work that needs to be done between council and the administration. Um, you know, I'm happy to participate in that. It sounds like Matt's happy to participate in it. It sounds like the administration and council would participate in it. I think going back to what August said, and it, since I wasn't there, um, it's understandable by me that what was supposed to happen didn't happen. And maybe we need to take one more bite at this apple because I feel right now that the commission just hear both sides of it and we're supposed to make a decision for something. And I don't think there's enough communication back and forth. So I think we should table it personally. I, 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 I agree. I, I don't think this is the planning commission's responsibility to, to um, arbitrate or mediate um, communication between the administration and council. That's just, that's not our charge. Our charge is here for, it's our civic responsibility to further the advancement of this community through, through development and, 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 and sound planning. So for that reason, I'm going to request that we table this again and give the kids another chance to come to the table and talk to one another. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel personally. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I've, if, if there is a motion to table, I'll be opposing it. I, I quite frankly, there's a, there's a feeling that the administration is stonewalling on this issue. Uh, this is not the end of the process. It moves into council committee. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, there was there was two weeks where no outreach was made to the two sponsors of the bill. Um, it's it's, it's to, to me to me. I think that you know, forward progress will compel those conversations to occur. Okay, there's so a motion have, on the table. So we have 1 motion to table. Is there a 2nd? A 2nd. So there's a motion 2nd. Further comments or questions from commission members? Um, Lillian, I do have a question though. Um, is the administration opposing the moving of this legislation? I'm not clear on that. Director? I'm going to defer to Jason Wood, who's going to provide that comment. Jason. I'm sorry, I, I broke. Can, I heard the beginning of your question. Um, so, so the question is, 
do, do, does the administration oppose this legislation? As constituted now, yes. Okay. Well, Lynn? That was my question. I got okay. it. It was a yes or no. Uh, so, Jason, if it benefits and you want me to be at those meetings, I'm happy to be there. Um, but it would be great to set up those meetings and what legislation, if any, needs to pass and how do we move forward with this? So we have a motion second. Uh, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. No. Chuckle. Yes. Slife. No. So we have two no's, but the motion carries. Um, good luck to everybody, and let me know if you want me involved with it. So let's move on to administrative approvals. Please take a look. I'll move approval. I'll take the motion once people review it. I'll move approval slight. Second downing. Motion is second. Further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. I had to abstain on item five. Curry. Um, I just wanted to check because um, you went so fast. Was there a piece to accept? Um, was there a piece on there to accept a grant for E66? No, there's not. Okay. And then it's, I just wanted to make sure I didn't have to abstain. Paul. Yes. Sorry. Yes. All right. Uh, we're moving on to design review. The first one is a freestanding electric message center for Holy Trinity Baptist Church, seeking final approval. Who's here for this? We have uh, Vicki Ricker, James Catledge, and Benjamin Harbaugh. So if you can all raise your right hand and do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is you shall answer under the penalty of perjury. Please uh, state your name when you say I do. You're muted. I apologize. I do, Vicki Ricker. Is there anyone else? Um, there'll be Cindy with me in, in uh, my office at Adam Signs. Could she say I do in her name? Yes, um, she did. Oh, did she? Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, Vicki. Okay. Um, on behalf of Holy Trinity Baptist Church and Adam Signs, we're presenting um, brand new uh, monument signage for the church. Um, we will... Uh, remove the existing signing and foundation. And we've been asked by the Southeast Design uh, Review Committee to relocate the, the sign uh, in the same yard space, but, but uh, to the south uh, um, by a few feet um, in a more spacious grass area. Uh, the new signage will have a brick base foundation. It will have an electric message center and also a new aluminum cabinet. And we're asking for approval. Okay. Um, did you see about uh, design reviews comments, adding beveled edges, and you said relocating the sign and then the brick should match the brick on the building? Yes. That's all been submitted. Okay. And you're good with that? Yes. Okay. Commission members? 
Move approval. Second, Fluker. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Curry. Yes. Yes. Spike. Yes. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. So design review for Trumco Manufacturing Facility, new construction. This is at 17610 Miles Avenue. Who's here for this? Uh, Philip Rosman. We have Philip Rosman and Tim Kraus. If you both could raise your right hand, do you soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. I do. Phil Rosman. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, Commission and Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a project for Trumco Incorporated. They're looking to expand their uh, capability at 4475 East 175th Street in Cleveland, Ohio. It is a expansion of about approximately 115,000 square feet, some two uh, two floors of production manufacturing, three floors of support area. Um, it, it'll lap over Warrensville Heights City, uh, Cleveland and Cleveland City property line. Uh, we've issued a alternative engineering design to both building departments, which have been approved. Uh, to be able to build over top of the property line. The existing conditions you can see here up on the screen, um, the properties to the to the to the right, which is to the east, are the Warrensville Heights properties. And then in front of the Momiko building uh, is the, the proposed new building will lap over both of those. Um, you have view one from from Miles Avenue is it's towards the east which is a Warrensville Heights property. View two is further as you go west, and then view three is an adjacent piece of property that is not occupied by um, Tremco, but they have purchased recently vacated East 176th Street. Um, there is a plot consolidation for those plots associated with that, and also plot consolidation for the Warrensville Heights properties. If you proceed to the next slide, please. These are some 3D renderings uh, of the proposed new building. Uh, there were a couple comments from from the design review boards about the windows in the circular portion on the northwest portion of the building, which we have updated in these views. Um, there was also uh, the latest comments from the design review were to increase those heights of those windows, which we plan on doing. We proceed to the next slide. This is a, a rendering of, of the facility. Uh, if you're looking southwest, it's the northwest, northeast corner here. Um, the front where the glass is, it will be the support area. The first floor of the support area will be maintenance, uh, maintenance and mechanical type of facility. The second floor will be more for employees with locker rooms, break rooms and such. And then the third floor in that front area will be a office type of area. You see they'll have truck docks on the west side, and then um, there are also truck docks on the south side of the building. We proceed to the next slide, please. This is our overall plot plan. Uh, we have highlighted there the, the existing parcels and the city line uh, kind of gives you a perspective of the existing property and then our new proposed with column lines. You can kind of it kind of outlines and and possible truck traffic. Next slide, please. Now, this is, gives you a better view of where the parcels are that will be consolidated. Um, like I said, are in process. You can see the truck docks on the west side of the new proposed and then truck docks also on the south. Proceed to the next slide, please. So these are just uh, slight layout plans and grading plans that we included in our design review package. Uh, we had an initial design review, I believe, on August 23rd, and then a follow-up on September. Here, 
is it number September 23rd. Um, next, the couple of slides are just um, your standard grading plans and such, site layout, and proceed. Uh, this is a front view of, um, of a street view that will be fencing, security fencing around the new building, matching exit, will line up with uh, existing fencing to give a secure site. Proceed to the next one, please. Just some road profiles and elevations from a site perspective. Following slide. So there was requested in our initial review to have some buffer landscaping to uh, to kind of buffer the trucking activities that will happen between uh, existing property Harold Salad and a new proposed. We have added that street buffering in between the two buildings and then also buffering in front of the new parking area, which is west of East 176th Street. We have received comments from the second go around with the design review um, board, and we will take those to know and adjust the landscaping for the recommendations. We do have two plans being shown or alternate. It's dependent. There are um, power poles and, and, and lights, street lights, or power poles and AT&T cable data um, power lines that Tremco is investigating on getting relocated to underground to provide a better street view and present this building. So the first, if, if those are removed, we would have taller type of shade trees uh, to kind of at the landscape in front of the north side of the building. And the next slide, uh, please show is kind of just a lower, lower buffering uh, of the of this decorative fence. Just didn't want to go too high and create like kind of like an alley in front of that fence so there'll be low ground type of plantings next slides please and then we just get into our architectural floor plans um, there'll be storage of raw materials on the floor and then also bulk storage on the west side in silos both interior and air and exterior here you can see the front support area on the ground floor with maintenance and mechanical type rooms. Next slide, please. This is of the second floor of the of the second floor of the support area, and which has your uh, locker rooms, lunch rooms, kind of employee amenities, and there'll also be an equipment platform uh, to service the, the inside mixed tanks. Next slide is the production second floor and the third floor of the support area to the north. Next slide, please. And then we just have a roof plan, uh, just kind of showing you where the drainage will be, roof, roof lines and such. These are our elevations of the proposed building. Um, it's, it is a tall building due to the requirements of the process inside. So you kind of get an understanding of the scale of the project from a, from a height perspective. Uh, the next slide, please. Just more elevations, um, street views. Next slide, please. Uh, interior cross sections of the building. You kind of get the picture of where the second floor will be an equipment platform and the height from the second floor to the roof to allow for the mixing equipment, the process equipment. This is a longitudinal section um, going from the south side truck docks all the way to the support area to the north. And then we just, uh, preliminary, we had to submit for Warrensville Heights also, and they requested some preliminary fire protection plans, and these are the next several slides. Just kind of indicating the zonings different types <clears throat> and then one more please a couple more and then our HVAC roof plan kind of tells you you go next one it's, it's a better presentation um, where our possible RTU units will be up on the roofs and so, so the front uh, will be uh, they'll have the screening on the front side to uh, to screen the units above the support area from a street even though it'll be pretty decently high anyway, so you possibly 
seeing those will be tough, especially with the screen long. Next slide, please. And then we just have some street lighting. Um, I'm not sorry, street lighting, parking area lighting and side lighting uh, to properly light the facility. That's the parking area on the west side. Uh, the next several slides, I don't know if we necessarily go through all of them, but they uh, kind of indicate the products that we will be using or propose to use for the skin of the building. Uh, with it being a Tremco building, we will try to use um, Tremco products and they have a very broad range of products. So we're gonna try to highlight a couple in different areas. The numbers of these products refer back to the elevation so you can understand what we're proposing where you wanna check back and forth through the re review. The main portion of the building will be this, we're proposing to have a drive it system on the previous slide, please which is just the metal light system, um, insulated panel type of system with a textured front fronting. And then they have a product called the Drive It New Brick. Um, that was the teal portion you saw on the elevation. So we're taking advantage of their Drive It New Brick system. Um, and various accents will have different types of product also. There's a product called the Dura Wall, which we're going to use for some of the forming for the concrete. Um, the circular portion of the building on the northwest side, we propose we're going to try to use this Dura, Dura Wall system as a showcase for Tremco. Uh, it's just an insulated form for the concrete. Uh, the glass curtain wall will be Connor system. And then the next slide is, is kind of gives you an understanding of the color of the product to be used on the front glazing. And then, so some of the, we will require some firewalls. So, uh, so we will use a king span insulated metal panel to get the ratings required. I think that might be the last ones. Uh, the roofing, we will be using a Tremco system. And then this is an approval letter from Mr. Commissioner Vanover uh, regarding the alternative engineering design. Do not have to build a party wall down the uh, city limit line between Cleveland and Warrensville Heights. Uh, it is not conducive for the process to have a wall separating the buildings on the Cleveland side and Warrensville Heights side. That's just the approval letter. And with that, that's the uh, completion of the presentation. Thank you. Mr. Bowen, we have, uh, we have Marka Fields from our staff. Marka? Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, just wanted to make a note that on your agenda, I believe it says that it's for um, schematic approval. This is actually for final approval. There was an uh, error in uh, what was sent to uh, Michael Bozak, but it, it is for final approval and um, with the conditions that uh, the that the committee listed on landscaping and uh, the windows. And they said that they were going to adhere to those. They are. Thank you, Marco. Mm -hmm. Commission members. I move approval on um, adding the uh, with the conditions that have been stated as a final. <laughs> Oh, correct. Our final approval. Mm -hmm. Second, Fluker. Okay, we have a motion second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. David? I said yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just don't, I'm not hearing some of these. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Curry. Yes. Yes. Slife. Yes. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. Design review for the near west. This is Cooper Flats Building 1. And I guess we're going to have a Cooper Flats Building 2. They're two separate cases. Who's here for this? We have Wesley Harper. I'm here, David. 
Hey, Wes. <laughs> so raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? Yes. Go ahead, Wes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, here we are uh, on the southern end of Duck Island. Uh, in this particular site plan, north is to your left. Um, you can see that uh, we're obviously along Wiley Avenue here uh, as it crosses Train Avenue, uh, west of the Creamery and the APL and south of uh, Port Duck Island. Um, St. Pendolins is directly to our west. Um, and then, um, uh, so the, the parcels in question, uh, the larger parcel 004022 is currently a city land bank parcel. Um, the parcel across the street is owned by Matt Burgess. And so this project is uh, basically a two site uh, project as mentioned, uh, but they will have similar design. Um, as we get into the presentation here, you'll notice that there is a good bit of topography here as uh, Wiley drops from its high point at Columbus Road to its low point at Train Avenue. So we're kind of in between that uh, procession there. And, and there, again, is a good bit of topography to contend with. Next. So here uh, at the upper left, we'll look at the largest image here. We're seeing Wiley as it heads uphill towards Columbus uh, in the background. Uh, you can also see uh, at the upper left, uh, the schoolhouse of uh, St. Wendelin's, or at least it was at one point, I believe it's vacant uh, currently. The current site um, is, uh, for the larger parcel is directly uh, across the railroad tracks along Wiley to the left. The Burgess pro uh, parcel is to the right uh, across the street. Um, the parcel to the left, the larger parcel, is still heavily vegetated, um, basically all the way to uh, the non-existent, or the, the heavily deteriorated sidewalk along Wiley. Um, and then the Burgess parcel across the street is used as access for the large townhome project for Kinez Homes. Um, I think they did a 19 or 20 unit townhome project kind of at the southeast corner of Duck Island. So the vegetation has been cleared from that portion of the site. At the upper left, we have con context photos. Um, here we're looking west heading up Wiley. Our parcel is to the left, Burgess's parcel is to the right. Um, uh, their imagery uh, along the bottom, we have uh, the large pit that uh, is heavily industrial, still in use uh, in some form or fashion. And then heading down Wiley, you can see the heavy vegetation and then uh, some detail of the retaining wall and St. Wendland School at the bottom right. Next. Uh, our proposed plan, uh, as I mentioned, the larger parcel uh, to the right is City Land Bank and to the left is privately owned. So here you can see the contour lines along the western edge uh, of the larger parcel that we're contending with. Um, and we have uh, an 18 unit apartment building lining the uh, widely facing property line. Um, and we of course want to uh, start to define the urban fabric as these two portions of Tremont start to connect with development. Uh, and so we also are hiding surface parking behind it uh, 18 units, 16 spaces on this site. Uh, you'll see a single family house also shown here. Uh, that is not part of the uh, discussion today. That will eventually be a, more of a custom home site. And so we'll come back uh, or go to housing design review subcommittee for that. Um, across the street, 12 unit apartment building. You can see the contour lines that we're contending with over there as well. So that forced us to put the surface parking um, to the right um, uh, of the parcel. So um, you can see uh, some detail of the uh, sidewalks that are leading up to uh, front uh, facing porches for the ground level units. Uh, we'll get into that in more detail as we look at the renderings. Next. So here we'll, we'll get right into those renderings. You're seeing the northern facade of the larger 18-unit uh, structure. Um, 
This is the result of conversations with the, the land banks design review disposition committee. Um, and so what we have are is a three story structure that kind of marches up the hill of Wiley. Um, so we allowed that to, to impact the, the facade and window placement. Uh, we also wanted to have a visible pedestrian uh, frontage. So each ground level apartment, which is uh, roughly 510 square, uh, would have a front porch facing Wiley, uh, six foot deep, 10 to 12 feet wide. So it would be usable for uh, residents to put a, a cafe chair or two and a table to, to sit outside. Uh, you can also see that each entry is defined with an overhead canopy, which uh, further defines that entry. Uh, the arcade in the middle of the uh, most front facing portion of the building is uh, looked at to be uh, a very prominent uh, element and that leads residents to the uh, back lobbies that uh, allow access and entry into the upper level units. Um, you can see we're dealing with a, a good bit of topography even along Wiley. Uh, and the way we've cited the building, we have allowed uh, a good amount of vegetation to exist in front of the building. Next. Uh, here's a view. It, it shows maybe a little more than the last rendering, the horizontally lapped cement board. Um, we wanted to, to keep this, this design relatively simple. Um, this building would have an element of uh, affordable housing as defined by Tremont West's uh, guidelines for, for using land bank lots in the neighborhood. Um, and so this also gives a little more detail into the porch uh, and the landscaping along the front. Next. Here, uh, we're looking at this arcade, uh, as we're calling it, uh, to be really a, a visual focus of the project and add a, a bit of uh, a visual interest here. So we're thinking, uh, you know, lighting could be a very successful way to uh, define that at night uh, and then also add a, a level of safety. So here we have just a very simple uh, vertical uh, element of lighting, could change colors. Um, and so we think, uh, you know, this will as a beacon to the project. Next. Uh, here's another view looking out from the rear parking lot uh, through the arcade. Uh, to the left, you can see one of the entries to the uh, upper level units. Uh, so we have a canopy jutting out to define that entry as well. Uh, for the interior of the arcade, we're looking to use a, a reflective metal cladding so that uh, the light bounces off from side to side and uh, have a play on light there. Next. Uh, here's a view of the second building across the street, obviously a uh, very similar design, uh, still allowing the topography to, to impact glazing along the south property line uh, and also having a good bit of landscape and first floor articulation. Next. Just another view of that building. Next. Uh, as I mentioned, is a, a lap siding that's horizontally oriented, uh, poor in place concrete, black window frames, and uh, elements and details with uh, black anodized aluminum panel. Uh, uh, very quickly, we'll go through this. Uh, the floor plans for each side of the project are, are similar, where we have uh, units facing the street, their living rooms and bedrooms facing the street, which allows us to have a uh, large expanse of windows along those facades, uh, with the kitchen uh, and utilities towards the rear. But here you can see the individual entries into the units. Um, you know, also going to be uh, to the bottom right it would be where trash uh, dumps would be, and then it would be uh, accessed from the eastern side of Unit 101 with a sidewalk along the property line. Uh, here you can also see the uh, procession to the porches from the sidewall uh, and the arcade as it uh, connects the parking lot and wild. Next. Then the upper levels are the same uh, for all those units. Uh, 
So we've got plans. Uh, the, the next few slides are exterior elevations. Uh, I know you're pressed for time, so I, I'd open it up to, to questions. Um, we are uh, seeking schematic design approval here. Uh, we presented to Near West last week, and uh, really the, the main point that they they uh, explained, they, they wanted to have uh, uh, the sidewalk along the 12 unit project or building to be eight foot wide instead of five, so that it could be an extension of the uh, two way trail uh, infrastructure that comes from train out. Uh, otherwise, uh, we were at uh, Tremont West Design Review, or excuse me, uh, Economic Development Committee last night. Um, there were no variances uh, to vote on. Um, so it's really uh, just kind of getting this out and introducing it to everybody. and. Interested to hear your comments. Thank you, Wes. Commission members. Uh, we had Dutch uh, Councilman Slife with his hand raised, I believe. Councilman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, design wise, I, I think this building looks really great. And I, I like that it's got sort of an industrial feel that lines up with Crane Avenue, which is one of Cleveland's more unique streets. Um, I guess my questions are uh, to the developer. Uh, th this is a pretty unique site uh, due to the slope. And I looked up the size of the two lots on uh, the county auditor's website, and I don't think either of them uh, exceed an acre. Uh, so I'm not sure if the permitting process would automatically kick in a review by a Cuyahoga Soil and Water. I'm wondering what kind of due diligence you've done uh, when it comes to, you know, there's this slope. Uh, that we use heavily vegetated. So right now it's taking in a lot of storm water. And as you start to develop on it, uh, are we going to be pushing more water down towards Train Avenue and kind of exacerbating flooding because there's not that, um, that, that, that natural surface to absorb? Has that been taken into consideration through all of this? Uh, because I'd hate, I'd hate for the process to not include it and uh, we would have wanted it to. Uh, yes, we have uh, submitted this to the uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District it, uh, for a determination letter. It will be reviewed under uh, Title Nine, I believe. I, I don't remember which one that is, but uh, it basically, we would have to have some sort of detention on site that would most likely be done uh, below grade at the parking lot. Um, uh, in regards to stormwater. Um, uh, outside of that, you know, we will be working uh, directly with uh, civil engineers over at Riverstone, and we would be tackling that. Uh, that you, you know, with every project in the city, you have to maintain and uh, basically uh, manage stormwater within the, the perimeter of your site. So um, that's something we do on uh, pretty much every project. Thank you. And, and a recommendation might even be uh, to, uh, if, to, if you haven't, and I'd be happy to make the connection, you can reach out to the diocesan real estate office because at the top of the slope, there's a parking lot that obviously predates a lot of uh, stormwater management best practices. And I would hate for, uh, uh, you know, all the water flowing from that parking lot uh, to affect your project and uh, you know, ultimate development. So it's just, just something I kind of flag knowing that area. It's like I said, it's unique and uh, we don't have those uh, types of slopes in many parts of the city that, that we have to contend with. Yeah. So. yeah, and welcome the introduction or, or at least uh, the contact. So, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, it is a pretty good site. You know, there's, it's funny, we've done a lot of projects around the ridge of the island and the stream on, and it's always, it's always a little bit unique, whether you're doing, you know, Chase mountains down 50 feet or uh, lucky and doing standing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Wes, this is August. Uh, great job as always. I, I love how you master sites. And um, this, is a, this is, in my opinion, simple but very impactful. Thank you. Is that a motion? Yes, I'm sorry. I moved to approve. Second, I agree with August. <laughs> so, so, okay, just to be clear, the first motion is for uh, building one. Okay. Oh. And we have a motion and second. Further discussion. 
Uh, I'd just like to say, Wes, you know, I always like to see you come to, in front of planning commission, see what you have to offer. And I think this one uh, is very exciting. So thanks. Uh, call the roll, please. Thank you. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fuker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Strife. Yes. All right. So now, uh, Cooper Plants Building Number Two. Commission members. I move to approve Building Two as presented. I'll second Downing. Motion is second. Further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Hooker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slife. Yes. So, so Wes, I got to tell you, I, I've been driving by that every day on my way to Tapper, and so I'm glad to see something's going to happen there. It is a very challenging site. Good job. Okay, we're moving on to Barber Avenue Townhome, new construction. And this is for schematic design approval. We have Ron. Ron, uh, <clears throat> start stat. Okay, Ron, uh, please raise your right hand. You soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury. Ron? Is Ron on the phone? On the phone. Hello? Ah, we got Hello? you. Okay, yeah. sorry. My security system on my computers will not allow me to hook up to any of these um, sites. So we have to do this by phone. And I'm ready for it. Okay. You. Ron, did you, I was swearing you in. Can, did you hear me? Oh, yes, I do. I agree. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Uh, if we can go to page two. This is three land bank properties on Bailey Avenue or Barber Avenue, excuse me. And we're going to put four market rate row houses and four associated uh, um, affordable apartments on the site also. Each row house will have an apartment to go with it. So if you take a look at the location map, the green dot is the location. And the general location is it's west of West 25th. If you take a look at the number two, you'll see the Nestle's plant there and it'll help orient you. <laughs> Uh, we're going to backload the garage off Joy Court. Now we are facing an issue where West 32nd Place and Joy Court are uh, dedicated right away by the city of Cleveland. However, they're not paved. Uh, the property is to the left of West 32nd Place. All have garages backed up onto it and they all use it to drive. Also, just north of the green dot is uh, parcel 00723042. That recently was a house. Um, and I bring this up because, oh, and that burned down or was no longer there, whatever. Uh, so I suspect that there's utilities in West 32nd place and they were also using that unpaid West 32nd place to get to their home. If we can go to page three, or no, page four. Yeah, Ron, I think we have different pages than you, but now we're look we're looking at well yeah, we're these don't. at an elevation. <clears throat> what was that? We're looking at an elevation. On page four. Uh, I don't I don't think your page numbers are lining up with what we have here. We have a site plan for page one. We have uh, building elevations for page two. Page three are, uh, well, the first uh, page two was, it doesn't say what uh, what elevation. Page three is north elevation, the rear yard. Page four is the revised garage plan. Uh, page five is the revised gar garage plan, second floor. 
And page six is revised garage elevation. And that's all I have. Well, yep. there's no sense in going further with this then. If you don't have the right drawings. Uh. I mean, the, the drawings I'm going on, off of are the same drawings that we presented to the Design Review, <clears throat> review Committee last week. So I don't know what how, what drawings you got, and I apologize for that. No, that's okay. So if you want what we could do, since you're not sure what drawings we have, if you could um, uh, organize with Michael Bozak what drawings you need here, we can table this and um, get you right away uh, next commission member or next commission. And, and that'll member. be when? Two weeks. Two weeks? Oh, okay. Okay. Here's the, here's the, well, if it's going to be two weeks, here's what I'm going to do then. Uh, I'll get a hold of Michael, but I'm in the process of revising the, the plans according to the comments from the design review committee. Good. And there will be three dimensional drawings also. So, and I'm the only thing I'm not completed or I've not completed are the three dimensional drawings and they should be done sometime in the middle of next week. So when I get all that together, I will call, I'll call Michael now, tell him what to expect. And then when I get the drawings done, I will get a hold of him again and email him all, Just email him the golden package. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much. So, okay, I, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Members, we're looking to table this for next yes. uh, commission meeting. Mr. Chair, I move that we table um, at the applicant's request. Second. Motion second. Uh, roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. All right. Yes. All right, Ron. See you next time. Okay. Design review proposed demolition of a two story apartment building. Who's here for this? We have Marilyn Masinski from uh, Slavic Village. Marilyn, I'm going to uh, swear you in. Do you soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so, lots, uh, so 550502 Fleet Avenue. Um, if you want to move to the next slide. Um, so, there was a smaller building to the left that was attached to this building that we had brought to you probably almost a year ago that we had demolished. Um, we had hoped that that would entice developers to come look at the building, which they did. We had folks look at it, walk it. Um, we did some minor details to it and folks that the building has been structurally damaged and could not be salvaged. Uh, click to the next slide, please. Um, just to give some perspective, the red dot is 5500 um, and that's on the corner of East 55th and Fleet. If you go one street to the left um, is East 54th is where Saucy Sawn is. And directly across from that, a couple of weeks ago, we brought the Andreoli family to you to redo a building over there, which if you haven't drawn down Fleet Avenue, he's almost completed with it. It looks amazing. He's really setting the bar for redevelopment on Fleet, I think, with that building. So we're excited about that. That being said, we've, um, we've talked to different folks at looking at this building at 5500. If you want to go to the next building, of, thank you. So you can see the inside has been broken into. Even when we got it, it was being damaged. We poured it up. More goes into it and gets keeps getting damaged. It got some water damage into the basement. Click to the next one. Thank you. Um, as you can see, more damage is done inside the building. Click again, please. Um, and click one more time. Um, so we are asking for um, approval for demolition for this so that we can move forward and look at a new development at this site. Um, we've gotten some people that are interested in it, and so we'd like to start some design work on it eventually. Um, but for right now, just to get the eyesore off, the fleet stakeholders have been on us. They feel that this is just an eyesore for the street and for their businesses. 
and all support the demolition of this building. So that's what we're seeking here. I know Councilor right. Frank Attili is also on. Um, I, if he's not sleeping still. <laughs> well, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, Councilman. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Commission members. I am uh, supportive of the demolition. Uh, we worked hard to try and find end users, uh, but uh, were not successful, and we had more interest in building new on this site. So clearing this site, setting the table, and taking advantage of resources that are available now to clear the site uh, is important for us. Um, and uh, as uh, Marilyn spoke, it had taken in a significant amount of water um, with uh, structural roof issues going all the way down the basement. So uh, uh, it's time for, for us to clear here and uh, entertain the, the new options that we have. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Chairman, I move approval, Downing. So we have a motion and second, and this is to demolish the building because it's structurally unsound. Uh, the historic characteristics of the building have been lost, and um, it's unsafe at this point. So uh, why don't we call the roll? Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Tucker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Yes. Slack. Yes. Good luck. Okay. The last one is a cats men's supportive housing new construction. This is at 3731 East 71st Street. Who's here for this? Um, Marilyn Moshinsky for Slavic Village. And we then have I know John Spielis from Community Assessment. Roxanne Wallace from Community Assessment. Bonnie Smith from Smith Arts. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. I do. I do. Can you state your name once you say I do? John Spielis, I do. Roxanne Wallace, I do. Bonnie Smith, I do. Marilyn Motions, I do. All right, who's going to start this off? I am Marilyn Motion Chief of Slava Village. I just want to give you a little bit of background on the, um, the project. If you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, so this, or keep going. Let's get to the building. Okay, so give you just a little background. Oh, go back. Go back a little bit. So we, Slava Village, received this building out of foreclosure. Um, it's a great historic building along a historic street. Um, we brought in several different developers and asked for different you know, proposals on the building. Um, CATS is a great partner in our neighborhood and had offered to do the best and the highest level of historic preservation on this building, along with keeping it active along the street. We were thrilled to pass this building on um, to them after we got it out of foreclosure. Um, so, with that said, Slavic Village is approved, uh, supportive of what they will be presenting to you today. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Scalish to talk a little bit about the project and Bonnie to talk about the design. Thank you, Marilyn. It's nice to talk. The agency. Well, no, need the history of the agency or just the history of this project? Well, the project's fine. If you want to say something about the agency, that's fine too. Okay, we'll just go to the. We've just been a, an alcohol and drug treatment center in Slavic Village for the last twenty eight years. So, um, scale is talk about the project. This project that we have is for a recovery house to offer residents a safe and structured living environment. Uh, we plan on providing the residents access to valuable relapse prevention services, case management peer support, mental health counseling, as well as uh, availability of our in-house employment program. Um, so when we saw this building, we thought it was gonna be the perfect use to uh, renovate and revitalize it. Uh, and we have our architect here to talk a little bit more. Okay, great. Uh, the, the project uh, will have a total of nine residents and we have if we could go to some of the next slides, take a take a look at the project. Keep if we could keep. Okay, so this is the houses that exist right now. 
And then uh, some of the following slides show you the context up and down the street. There are some other um, houses. There are some vacant lots. There are some commercial property. I think I didn't print out the whole slide presentation for myself, but if you could just keep moving through this. Okay, good. Okay, and then that's looking north toward Broadway. Uh, we have, uh, you know, vacant lots, commercial buildings. This is a view across the street. Uh, there's a, uh, I believe, a, a church building or, or something like that directly across the street, and then a gas station on the corner. Uh, and then the homes that remain are, are you know, stately, uh, well-constructed homes. And uh, we hope to be able to fit our building back into the character of the street. And then uh, when we presented to the design review committee, if you could just go to the next the slide with the toward a multifamily housing. Okay, go back one. No, well, and one acres. And uh, what we propose, one more. Hmm. If you could go to the, the little site plan. Anyway, we're, we're going to recondition the turf and of debris, old tires and things like that on the adjacent lot. And uh, uh, we're going to add some uh, hydrangeas that, that should provide reasons of interest. And then we can progress to the, we presented to the design review committee for uh, the East design review committee. If we could go to the elevations of the, uh, the actual little Buildings that have colors on them. There we go. Okay, one more. We presented a total of well, four actually, schemes. Think, yeah. I'm sorry, I David. Yeah, I can actually see the elevation. Oh, okay, good. Good. Yeah, and we can too. So we pre presented. Uh, four color schemes feeling that it should be you know something very participative with the uh the local design review committee and the uh community development corporation so we did a blue scheme the next page would be let me see uh a mustard scheme the following page was a sage scheme and then the final page is the teal scheme uh there we're we're fortunate in that uh, the siding, the existing wood siding is, is in pretty good shape. So we're going to be repainting the siding, the teal. Uh, it's, you know, the colors a little difficult to communicate exactly what they are. The windows will be replaced because uh, there was some damage to the property and all the windows were, were broken out. Uh, and they're old vinyl windows anyway, but we're going to be putting back. Um, a, uh, a a Pella product, the aluminum clad windows, and the poplar white. You know, don't think white. It's not a white window. It's kind of a buttery soft yellow. So we've got the soft teal, the soft yellow, and then the soffits and some of the other trim in the front door are going to be a a rather pleasant uh, taupe, which Sherwin Williams calls pewter tankard. So um, and then the the other materials, the, the roof is less than a year old. It was put on in January of 2020 uh, in the stone. There's a stone solid stone foundation and some lovely brick chimneys chimneys. They'll be cleaned and tuck pointed and just, you know, preserved hopefully for the next. Uh, I think the building was built in 1925. So coming up on almost a century, you know, preserved for maybe another, you know, 50 or perhaps 100 years, the building be able to be enjoyed. Uh, we did, I believe, present some floor plans of the building to show the, the use, the, the nine rooms for the community housing. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, very, uh, very simple project. Uh, the only new materials on it really are the windows. So uh, we received 
final review approval on the teal scheme from the design uh, committee uh, last week, and we're hoping to move forward with your final approval. Thank you. Nice to see you, Bonnie. Thank you. Uh, see you too. Commission members? I move approval. It's a great renovation. So thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Motion is second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul. Yes. Slight. Yes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Director, do you have a report? Should we adjourn the meeting? I move to do Okay. So. Meeting adjourned. Yes. Do we have a report? I'm unmuting here. It's not working. I can yeah, hear you. We can, hear you. we can hear you. Oh, okay. It's weird. Okay, here we go. So um, I don't have a report, just a update for you guys uh, that I'm going to send out on October 16th at 1230. Uh, we're going to be hosting a city club forum, um, building the 21st century city with A.D. Tomer, uh, who's mm -hmm. a Brookings fellow. And we're going to be discussing technology and innovation um, in cities. And this is cursor uh, to our building a 21st century city conference that's going to be taking place in March. So uh, when you get the invitation, if you guys are able to attend that virtual event, it will be really great. There will be a presentation. Uh, he and I will engage in some dialogue, and then there will be a Q and A, a Q and A, uh, which is typical of uh, a virtual city club forum. So I just wanted to give you guys that update. Um, the discussion will be very, I think, interesting, and um, it'll also be sort of the setup for our conference that's going to be coming up first quarter of next year in March. Thank you, director. That's it. That's it. Okay. Hey, uh, Freddie, I'm going to call you right after the meeting. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye everybody. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you guys. Thank you.